moment to uh, uh, come on in and find your seats. We will begin with some announcements and then start our service. It is good to see every one of you here today. Um, I see we're a little bit thinner than normal. I think we have a large contingent who traveled out to Texas over the weekend for a wedding of one of our former members, as well as some other travel on this uh, uh, what not holiday weekend, I suppose, this memorial weekend. So, Don, whenever you've got the announcements up, we shall begin. Okay, just a few things to bring to your attention. Uh, this year we began Bible reading each month, encouraging members of the congregation to find a partner or a buddy and read through a month of scripture. Um, you don't have to read it together, you each read during the day at some point and share a comment or observation or encouragement with each other. So we are just finishing Psalm 31 through 60 this month and next month begins 1st and 2nd Corinthians. So if you'd like to participate, I encourage you to either find your own buddy to read with or if you'd like a partner, you can send email to Bible Reading or Bible Buddies, I think it's Bible Reading at branchofhope.org, and we can try to pair you up. Next item is new members class. We uh, hold these periodically for those who would desire to become members here at Branch or those who simply want to learn a little bit more about our church and its structure and doctrine. So Dan Parkins is out of town today. Jason Gallagher will be covering that class. Uh, the last couple of weeks, I think you've heard mention that June is Pastor Appreciation Month, and we are uh, taking this as an opportunity to encourage and show love to our Pastor Paul. Next Sunday, there will be a barbecue, uh, and we would invite you to participate and to bring a side dish to share with others. Uh, I was asked to note that the barbecue will be held outdoors, so if you're you know, subject to the cold and the wind, be sure to dress appropriately. Uh, also upcoming on June 11th, and that's a Saturday, is a men's beach event, um, some sports, activities, and fellowship, and I believe there'll be some food and lunch. Uh, information in the bulletin as well. You can also reach out to Jerry Ortiz, who is helping to uh, coordinate and organize that. Okay. And just a few items that are not up on the wall itself. Um, coming up later in the month of June is a tacos and talent night. Anyone 18 and under is welcome to participate in the uh, talent show. And uh, please contact Shannon Trimper for more information. $5 a person um, and bring dessert or drinks to share. And throughout uh, June, July, and August, uh, the end of each month, June 26th, July 24th, August 28th, there will be monthly uh, summer beach fun picnics at 1.30 at Avenue I in Redondo Beach. So come and uh, enjoy the fellowship of others gathered there at the beach. Uh, specifically now toward today's service and next week, uh, Pastor Paul is out of town and Elder Bob Peruca will be exhorting us today, so we look forward to that. And uh, Reverend Alan Pontier is here and he will be administering uh, the Lord's Supper and the benediction today. So we look forward to those things. Uh, last thing of note is next Sunday, June 5th, we will be returning to normal distribution of communion elements. And for those who have need, we will continue to provide a limited supply of prepackaged elements both outside and in the church office. So we look forward to that uh, transition next week. So at this time, um, we will turn our attention to our worship service. Today's call to worship will be Proverbs chapter 3, verses 1 through 8. Let us take just a moment to quiet our hearts as we prepare to hear God's word. Proverbs 3, 1 through 8. My son, do not forget my law, but let your heart keep my commands for length of days 
and long life and peace they will add to you. Let not mercy and truth forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. And so find favor and high esteem in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he shall direct your paths. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and depart from evil. It will be health to your flesh and strength to your bones. Please join me in prayer. Heavenly Father, you are the King of glory, holy and righteous, and all your ways are just and true. There is none beside you, O Lord, and we delight in you. Your beloved Son, our Savior Jesus, was delivered up for our transgressions and raised for our justification, and we entrust our souls to him. You are our shield and protector and deliverer, and we rest in your goodness and grace. We exalt in your name as we gather to offer praise and worship before your throne. The Proverbs we just read emphasize the importance of our hearts. Our hearts are to keep your commandments, We are to write steadfast love and faithfulness upon our hearts, and we are to trust you with all our hearts. You desire a people who love and seek after you with our whole heart. We ask that as a potter forms wonderful things from seemingly insignificant piles of clay, that your Holy Spirit will be at work in our hearts and lives, transforming us into the image of Christ and into vessels of honor fit for the Master's use. Yet the Proverbs also warn us to not be wise in our own eyes, but to fear the Lord and turn away from evil. In response to these words, we enter now into a time of silent confession of sin, acknowledging that we fall short of the glory of God and need the forgiveness and cleansing offered freely to us in the gospel. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for hearing our confession of sin and for the assurance of pardon that is found in Jesus, our Savior. Amen. What can wash away our sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make us whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Jesus Christ brings healing to our flesh and refreshment to our bones. In a word, he cleanses us from all unrighteousness. So brothers and sisters in Christ, if you have confessed your sins and put your trust in Jesus alone for your salvation, then I declare to you what the scriptures declare, that your sins are forgiven.
sorrow bear. Praise God and on him cast your care. Oh, praise him. Oh, praise him. This morning's congregational reading, we will be continuing through the Westminster Shorter Catechism. Today we will be looking at questions 94 through 95. I will read the question and then we will as a congregation join in the response. Question 94, what is baptism? Baptism is a sacrament wherein the washing with water in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost does signify and seal are engrafting into Christ and partaking of the benefits of the covenant of grace and our engagement to be the Lord. Question 95, to whom is baptism to be administered? Baptism is not to be administered to any that are out of the visible church till they profess their faith in Christ and obedience to him. But the infants of such as our members of the visible church are to be baptized. Let us pray. 
Heavenly Father, we come before you once again on this Lord's Day in joy and praise and worship. And we thank you that we are washed, we are signed, we are yours. We thank you that you've given us the sacrament of baptism and the Lord's Supper to show our communal mark as believers and members of your flock. We come here before you today, God, during this time of tithes and offerings, and we remember that everything that is given to us comes from you and your abundance and your generosity. And even though we're beset by just troubles and tribulations and worries about our financial state, may we always keep in mind that you always provide, you always take care of us, you always make sure that we have what we need and then some. We come before you with our tithes and offerings, presenting them to you, and we continue to lift up the deacons and the elders as they oversee these funds and their distribution, and may they always give these funds and use these funds with an attitude of charity and discernment, and may those who receive it, receive it joyfully and understand that it is part of your provision for his people. We lift up all these things in your son's name, amen. So this is a time in our service where we go before the Lord on behalf of the needs of our congregation. And I'd like to uh, remind you that elders and deacons will be available this Sunday, and our intent is every Sunday after the service up here in the front uh, for those who would like individual prayer. Or you can always uh, contact your elder or send prayer requests to the church at prayer at branchofhope.org. Uh, before we pray, I'd like to read 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. So we do not lose heart, though our outer self is wasting away, our inner self is being renewed day by day. For this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the same things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Join me as we go before our Heavenly Father in prayer. Heavenly Father, we ask that you would give your church an eternal perspective. Let us not cling tightly to the things of this life, but turn our affections on things above. May we know the joy of communion with our Savior and by your spirit possess a peace that passes all understanding and that guards our hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. May we view our trials through the lens of faith and see them as gifts from a gracious and loving Father, and may we trust your good providence. We also ask that you make your church to be a faithful witness of grace and truth. Equip us to boldly proclaim the good news that Jesus bore our sins on the cross that he rose and ascended to the right hand of God, and that he has conquered sin and death and ever lives to intercede on behalf of his people. May we know your mercy and comfort in our lives so that we are ready to comfort those who are in need, sharing with them the same comfort of Christ that you have shown to us. We pray for the leaders of all nations that they would bow the knee to Christ and govern in accordance with your will. We pray for the leaders of our country, state, and local communities that you would accomplish your will in and through them. Lord, we're mindful of the daily headlines, the tragedies, and evil that surround us. We're particularly mindful this week of the school shooting in Uvalde, Texas, and pray your grace upon those affected by this tragedy. This is but one painful reminder of the effects of sin and lawlessness. Truly, we need thee every hour, most gracious Lord. We pray for revival for a nation whose God is the Lord. We pray for Pastor Lyon 
and the ministry of Carson OPC that you would bless and flourish their work in that community. We pray this week for OPC missionaries Mark and Laura Ambrose serving in Cambodia. We ask you would bless their ministry of caring for victims of sex trafficking, the impoverished, the neglected, and marginalized. Please equip Mark as he trains Cambodian Christian doctors to practice gospel-centered medicine so they can start Christian clinics and better serve their communities. We pray now for specific needs of our congregation. Lord, there are many, many requests listed in our bulletin. We will mention just a few here at this time, but we know that you are aware and attend to all of our needs, both those written and acknowledged and those that we each carry privately ourselves. Uh, we lift up our brother, John Clayton, who was hospitalized a couple days ago with a blood clot in his heart and is anticipating uh, tests, possible surgery today or tomorrow. We ask that you care for John and provide comfort and strength to both he and Bridget. We pray for Marty and Kim, stepfather and mother of Dan Parkins. Uh, Dan reports doctors suspect Marty may have prostate cancer and Kim is struggling with early onset dementia. We pray your care upon this couple and that you would encourage Dan as he ministers to them. We pray for former member Darcy Bradbury, who has a serious condition called histoplasmosis, which requires treatment, but which may also adversely affect her kidneys and uh, bring complications to other conditions she has. We pray you administer to Darcy. We pray for branch member Bill Holler, who's rarely able to attend in person. Uh, Bill's hearing has declined, and we ask, Lord, that you would allow that to be helped by uh, hearing aids and that he would be able to adapt to them and be able to better communicate with his family, something we simply take for granted. We pray for Kenny Valdir's mother, Linda, who has congestive heart failure and currently in ICU. We ask you to pour out your grace upon her and the family. And Lord, in this situation and in all these situations, we pray for those family members and loved ones who do not know Christ that this might be the occasion of their salvation. We pray for Stacy and Tyler Bonds and their baby Peter. We pray your blessing and a care upon their needs at this time as you provide both for your glory and for their good. We also lift up those many in our church family who have family members suffering from dementia and Alzheimer's disease, care for both those who are ill and for our members providing care to them. And we continue to pray for those battling cancer. In particular, we would lift up our members, Julie Herzl, Rex Monson, Andrea Lucero, and Mike Keon, as well as many uh, family members and loved ones listed in the bulletin. Thank you, Lord, for hearing our prayers, for being a loving father who cares for the needs of your children and who delights in doing good on our behalf. Teach us to rejoice in hope of the glory of God and patiently endure suffering, knowing you are producing godly character and pouring out your love into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. Bless now the preaching of your word and the remainder of this service. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.
I'm one of the elders here, and uh, it's my turn to exhort today. Pastor Paul is at the Ranch of Hope in Texas, and he is um, getting a well-deserved rest. Um, Grant had mentioned a few uh, weeks ago when he was up here that um, it's really an effort, and um, it's challenging to put together uh, a presentation that is uh, cogent and meaningful and um, can encourage and edify. So um, I do appreciate Pastor Paul's ability to um, get up here every week. And in fact, I kind of liken him to a LeBron James, you know, he's, or maybe a, maybe a Michael Jordan. I don't know, Dan says he prefers Michael Jordan, but he's our star. Uh, and uh, he's toward the end of his career, but we want to stretch him out. We want him to play 26 minutes, 28 minutes, and then come in at overtime and not play 48 minutes and wear him out. So we do appreciate the opportunity as elders to come up here and uh, speak and give him a break. Before I begin, um, I'd like to uh, share that as I'm exhorting here, I'm really talking to myself because even yesterday I had a situation where I could have handled something differently. And it reminded me of Psalm 51.3, for I know my transgressions, my sin is ever before me. So <laughs> I didn't handle it in a very uh, Christian way. And so uh, as I read this, and I exhort, I'm really talking to myself as well. So I humbly ask your prayers. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for your mercy, your grace. Thank you for your opportunity today to exhort, to be a part of the building up of your church. I pray today that uh, you would activate the Holy Spirit in our hearts 
that you would renew our minds, and that you would illuminate our understanding as uh, we uh, dive into your word today, Father. This book, this short epistle that is so full of meaning and significance. I ask that Christ be exalted and lifted up, and that you would be glorified in this process. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen. So today's reading is Jude 20 and 21. I've entitled this, this exhortation, Keep Yourselves in the Love of God. Now hear the word of the Lord. But you, beloved, building yourselves up together in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God waiting for the mercy of your Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So one of my intentions today is to redirect our focus to this oft-neglected book of God's inspired word, the book of Jude. It's the fifth shortest book in Scripture. It's only 25 verses long. It's 65 out of 66 books, and its place is right before the mammoth work of the Revelation. So, I've been a Christian for over 20 years, and I've heard a sermon on Jude maybe twice, so I think it's fair to say that this book tends to get neglected. However, spending time in this, in this rich epistle in our Bible study, uh, I would say that this epistle, epistle bears much fruit, and though it was written almost 2,000 years ago, it has direct application to our lives and our culture like all of Scripture today. There is nothing new under the sun, and the challenges we face today are mirrored in the book of Jude. So there are three points that I'd like us to think through together today. Point number one, the Christian life is active. Immediately upon being reborn, we are called to action. Our lives have a trajectory, and this trajectory is either in a positive or negative direction in regards to the faith. We are never static. Secondly, there's a severe consequence of judgment for those who seek to alter the gospel and lead believers astray. And third, there's a great reward for Christians as we persevere in the faith, and we contend for the faith, and we run the race that is set before us. So let's take a look at the four verbs in this passage. Building, praying, keep, and waiting. In being called to action, we are to confirm our calling and election, 2 Peter 1.10. We are exhorted to live a certain way, obeying what Christ has instructed in us to, to obey and what we are to believe and how we are to live. If I remember one thing from English grammar is that verbs are action words. So let's look at the first verb, building. The theme of building is found throughout Scripture. Psalm 127.1, unless the Lord builds the house, those who build it labor in vain. 1 Corinthians 14.20, so with yourselves, since you are eager for manifestations of the Spirit, strive to excel in the building up of the church. 1 Thessalonians 5.11, therefore, encourage one another and build one another up, just as you are doing. And then finally, from our Lord, Matthew 7.24, everyone who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. And the rains fell, and the floods came, and the winds blew, but it did not fall because it had, been, it had been founded on the rock. So, we can all relate to the act of building. It's a satisfying enterprise to build something, whatever it is. It's a fence, furniture, an addition, a house. For several years, I drove the northern Baja coast, coastline back and forth to our apparel factory in Ensenada, and in 2006... I dove in, and I bought a piece of property about 100 yards from the ocean in a gated community. It's a beautiful spot. 
My contractor, who I nicknamed the maestro, was talented. Yet I later discovered that he had a bit of a slippery slide. And I also had a plumber who he nicknamed Leaky Lopez. So the, the building of the house was <laughs> quite the journey, and I experienced several sleepless nights wondering what I had gotten myself and our family into with this venture. Dealing with a different culture from my gringo perspective was one thing. But there were all kinds of issues we discovered after the house was built. There was the flood resulting from a faulty seal on the top bathroom tub where water gushed down the stairs and out the front door. There was the unintended waterfall down the north wall of the front room when it rained. I could go on, but the most interesting issue came about when I ran my first load of laundry. During the rinse cycle, I walked outside, and I noticed that there was suds streaming down the side of the house and out into the street. After further examination, I realized that the large hole on the side of the house was unconnected to any drainage pipe because it had never been hooked up to the normal drain outflow. So, taking several deep breaths, I approached the maestro the next day and I brought this incomplete work to his attention. He paused, he shook his head, he said, Bob, I told those guys to hook that pipe up, I can't believe they didn't do it. But your house has a firm foundation. All right. That's great, Art. We got a waterfall down the wall of the house. We have suds going out the side of the, out along the side of the house. He said, the foundation is strong. This house is not going anywhere. So that was his go-to response when there was a problem discovered. The house was not going anywhere. It had a firm foundation. So to the maestro's credit, after several makeovers, repairs, leaks, and revisions, the house is still standing strong 15 years later. It does indeed have a firm foundation with deep trenches, lots of cement, lots of rebar, and it's firm. So the moral of the story is the foundation of any building is critical. Jude, likewise, exhorts the believers, God's beloved, to build upon the strong foundation of your most holy faith. That would be, as verse 3 states, the faith once and for all delivered to the saints. There's a finality to this phrase, once and for all. It's a decisive event. This is the faith. It has been delivered. God has spoken, as Francis Schaeffer would say. Here, the faith indicates the content of the message taught by the apostles and held in common by all Christians. The faith referred to in verse 3, it's the authoritative body of belief given by God to the church through the apostles. Now, together with the Old Testament, this faith is built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Christ himself being the cornerstone, Ephesians 2.20. The apostolic witness, as found in the New Testament, is the standard for the church. 2 John 9 states, Everyone who goes on ahead and does not abide in the teaching of Christ does not have God. Whoever abides in the teaching has the Father and the Son. So the church is to be built up together on this foundation of the faith. This corporate growth benefits the church body as well as the individual. So as believers, through building on this most holy faith, when we are actively engaged in the process of expanding God's kingdom, we are living stones that grow into a holy temple in the Lord, Ephesians 2, 23. So looking again at verse 3, we are to contend for this most holy faith. Now, contend is an interesting word. It's based on the Latin word contendere, which means to draw tight to make an effort, to strive, to stretch, to compete. This verse is a favorite of Christian apologists, and understandably so is the goal of apologetics is a defense of the Christian faith. I'm honored to be part of this very active church with this emphasis on apologetics from Pastor Paul 
who does not shy away from any challenge to defend the faith, to those who are involved in midnight shows on, on KKLA, the radio shows, the apologetics.com show, uh, the apologetics conferences, and the podcasts. These are all part of contending for the faith. And the concept of contending for the faith can be extended to our church ministries who are engaged in the apologetic enterprise through the worship team, the elders, the deacons, the church staff, the fellowship meals. I would also include those hosting Bible studies, bringing friends to church, showing hospitality to others. How about the faithful mothers and fathers bringing their children up in this most sacred and holy faith as you lay a foundation for your children to grow up one day to defend the faith? That's amazing. We realize on the one hand we're a hospital, a church full of sinners, and we're in need of pure grace with nothing in our hands to bring. Yet, I'm encouraged by the striving, the effort, the battle that we all engage in, contending for the most holy and sacred faith in the stations of life that everybody finds themselves in. The Apostle Paul sums up this idea in Romans. Romans 8, 4, Romans 8, 4 through 5. For as in one body we have many members, and the members do not have all the same function, so we, though many, are one body in Christ, and individually members of one another. But why did the apostle, he's not an apostle, excuse me, why did Jude write this epistle? What was his, what was his intent in writing this short epistle? There's one word, heresy. Heretics had entered the church and were looking to rend the social fabric of the flock. So let's take a moment here to define our terms. What is heresy? I'm going to quote Dr. Robert Godfrey on this as his definition of heresy says, some people use the word heresy simply to mean any error or a fairly serious error in theology. But classically, the word heresy was used to describe those theological errors so serious that it would deprive one of salvation. There are some errors that are there are some errors that are so huge they are really cutting us off from God because we have so misunderstood him and his truth. So this is why a correct understanding of the fundamentals of the faith, who God is, who we are, and what Christ has accomplished on our behalf is so critical. In fact, salvation hangs in the balance of a correct understanding of the Word of God and who God is. So Jude starts out writing this epistle about something other than heresy. Verse 3, Dear friends, although I was very eager to you to write about the salvation we share, I felt compelled to write and urge you to contend for the faith that was once for all delivered to the saints. So why the sudden turn in Jude's subject from the salvation we share to contending for the faith? There's an urgency to Jude's calling the congregation together to address this new challenge that entered the church. False prophets had weaseled their way into the church. They were slipped in unnoticed, promoting a libertine lifestyle with a highly charged sexuality. So Jude 4 reads, For certain people have crept in unnoticed, who long ago were designated for this condemnation, ungodly people who pervert the grace of our God into sensuality and deny our only Master and Lord, Jesus Christ. These people had made their way in to the Christian community by feigned relationship and flattery. And Jude's task is to unmask them, to expose them, while at the same time issuing a stern warning for his flock not to be taken in by this false teaching. These heretics are marked out for judgment. They had altered the doctrine of grace of God and turned it into a justification for sexual ex excess. They have read the doctrine of grace through their own corruption and transformed it into something wholly other and therefore have become apostates and turncoats. So for the next several verses, Jude draws on archetypal examples of sin from the Old Testament, warning his readers again of the greater judgment to come upon false teachers. They will pay for their sin of misleading the faithful, and Jude puts these heretics in the same category as the transgressors of Sodom and Gomorrah, 
who had departed, as we know, from the natural order of things. They have gone the way of Cain, who was of the evil one and murdered his brother. And why did he murder him? Because his own deeds were evil and his brother's righteous. That's 1 John 3.12. Jude also cites the sons of Korah, who led the rebellion against the authority of Moses and Aaron. Their resulting divine judgment is paralleled by the heretic's rebellion against the church's authority and their ability to lead others astray. So Jude is reaching back into the Old Testament to show how there's a parallel here between the current situation in the church that he's encountering and the Old Testament. Again, there is nothing new under the sun. So Jude continues his attacks. He spends a lot of time here going after these guys. Jude 12 through 13. These are hidden reefs at your love feasts. As they feast with with you without fear, shepherds feeding themselves, waterless clouds swept along by the winds, fruitless trees in late autumn, twice dead and uprooted, wild waves of the sea, casting up foam of their own shame, wandering stars for whom the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved forever. Wow. Wow. thinking about this, these uh, images, and the, uh, the farmer waits for rain, and he sees the clouds, hoping for relief from drought, yet the waterless clouds are empty of promise. As Pastor Paul has indicated in our study of Revelation, the use of the ocean as a metaphor points to, points to evil. The heretics are like wild, stormy waves that would cause chaos and destruction. And what would it feel like to be a, a wandering star cut loose from the sovereignty of God's control over the universe, headed for utter darkness that has been reserved forever for these wandering stars. We get the feeling that Judas filled with jealous, righteous rage for those trying to infiltrate his flock. So while Jude paints a vivid scene of the doom that awaits these seeking to disturb and divide the unity of the church, His urgent call is again to warn believers and warn us of these false teachers that proclaim an antinomianism that projects Jesus as Savior, but not Jesus as Lord. So let's look at the second verb, pray. Jude calls the church to prayer. They are to pray in the Holy Spirit. The heretics, in verse 19, are devoid of the Spirit, and what marks the church out from the world is is the possession of the Spirit and communion with God through His agency. Praying in the Spirit defines the life of us, of the true people of God, by God's grace. The apostolic faith and the Holy Spirit, Word and Spirit, are the defining characteristics of the true Christian community. The gospel is held forth, and the Spirit is at work, renewing the minds of every believer in every true Christian church. Ephesians 6.18, Paul exhorts us to pray at all times in the Spirit with all prayer and supplication. So we pray for the presence of, of, and the help of the Spirit. We attend to the preaching of the, God's Word, which is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and training in righteousness. It's Timothy 3.16. We confess our sins and abstain from sin so as not to grieve the Spirit of God. James 5.16, Therefore, confess your sins to each other, pray for each other, so that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. Again, we are to act. Christianity demands that we act. Praying is active. Praying is intentional, where we intentionally lay up our request to the creator and sustainer of the universe in reverence, humility, and sincerity. So Jude exhorts the believers then to keep themselves in the love of God. What could be better to be kept than to be kept in the love of God? This is an imperative. Believers are to act in a way that will protect and guard them from heresy. The heretics, like the ancient prototypes Jude cites, did did not keep their proper place, but they crossed the line to participate outside of their allotted domain. The Exodus generation and Sodom and Gomorrah were guilty of not keeping the proper order laid down by God. 
The heretics were trying to divert the church down a similar path by altering the gospel and persuading members to follow their licentious lifestyle. Jude calls the believers not only to contend for the faith, but to guard, to hold on to the faith that they have received. Verse 24, now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling, God will preserve our faith. However, God's preservation of the saints does not minimize our responsibility to persevere in faith and to support each other's perseverance. We keep each other in the love of God through close ecclesial fellowship and prayer, and so we are accountable to each other for that. The imperative of action is rooted in God's steadfast love shown through his act of grace. This grace is a part of God's gracious gift. The inclination for us to act righteously comes from God and is rooted in the character of God. The believers are to obey the commands of God, to hold on to these truths, and to maintain a certain state of purity through focused, intentional effort and prayer. Supplication to the commands of Christ, participation in the sacraments, and holy living. To make our calling certain, keeping themselves in the love of God echoes verse 1 where Jude identifies Christians as those who are beloved by God and kept for Jesus Christ. God's love was the cause of their election, and Jude exhorts them to stay in this love of God. So we're now in our last verb in this verse, wait. That's hard for me, to wait. Believers are to wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. There's an anxious expectation of the kingdom of God and the final consummation. The vivid hope of Christ's return is part and parcel of being a Christian, yet we live godly lives in the present. We have a lively expectation of final consummation, and that hope is not escapist, but frames and informs our life in the present age. As Pastor Paul indicates that when we live heavenly-minded, we are joyful and at peace, knowing that this life is not all there is. We are blessed with mercy, which is the compassion, kindness, or clemency extended to those in need. Mercy is the opposite of judgment, which, which will befall those who disobey the gospel, who harden their hearts when hearing the good news. 1 Peter 1, 1 Peter 1, 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. According to his great mercy, he has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance that is imperishable, undefiled, and unfading. This merciful, gracious future is what the Christian, the true believer, has to look forward to and is the mercy that Jude exhorts his church to hold fast to. By keeping themselves in the love of God, genuine followers of Christ stand in contrast, again, to those Old Testament examples where they did not keep their place in submission to God. They rebelled. These people are kept in chains, awaiting judgment. Not a very popular message today. Believers can anticipate the mercy of Jesus Christ shown supremely in his coming resurrection. Their end, our end, is filled with hope, is filled with glory, and is even further impetus to avoid the way of the heretics. God's mercy is supremely shown in human salvation through faith in the person and work of Christ. The mercy of the Lord Jesus Christ shown to them upon his coming will bring eternal life, anticipating the final day when we will all have resurrected bodies and live eternally with God. Psalm 27, 18. Wait for the Lord. Be strong and let your heart take courage. Wait for the Lord. Waiting is active. When I wait on God's timing, I need to actively address my impatience, and focus my heart in another direction. Waiting on God's plan to unfold in the midst of 
present trouble, we are called not to give up, no matter how trying our circumstances, but to rather give God time to answer. It's tough. I'm not sure about you, but this is one of the greatest challenges of the Christian walk for me. I'm a task guy. Give me a list so I can get stuff done. Just ask my wife. I make a list each day, then take joy in crossing off the tasks accomplished. And when finished, I take even greater joy in throwing away that piece of paper. There's a great satisfaction to crumpling that paper up and tossing it in the trash can. However, the problem is half the time I have to reach back in that trash can because there's something important on that piece of paper. I actually call the trash can my second filing cabinet. My point is that waiting requires faith, trust, hope, and discipline. It takes effort to wait. Yet we do wait for that glorious day when Jesus comes back to renew all things, to make everything right. Revelation 22.30, He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. Revelation, as Pastor Paul has pointed out, is meant to give us comfort that the victory is won. Yet we as Christians experience longing for the realization of God's purposes accompanying the second coming. This seems to be what Jude has in mind as we wait for the mercy of Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So as we close, let's, let's think through this passage together one more time as I read it and take a look at its richness in regards to the doctrine of the Trinity. But you, beloved, building yourselves up together in your most holy faith and praying in the Holy Spirit, keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of your Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. So all three persons of the Godhead are referenced here. All three are involved in our salvation and keeping us in the love of God. We are elected by the Father who, in Ephesians, has blessed us in Christ with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places and by whom we are adopted in Christ Jesus. We are redeemed by the Son, again in Ephesians 1, in whom we have redemption through His blood. We are delivered from the guilt of sin by our faith in Jesus' person and work by the blood of Christ shed at the cross. We are sealed by the Spirit since when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, and believed in him, you were sealed with the promise of the Holy Spirit, who is a guarantee of our inheritance. The Christian life is an active life. We build, we keep, we pray, we wait, we endure, we persevere, we contend all with the power and grace of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit. Jude 24, 25. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy, to the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time, now and forever. Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for this day you've given us. Thank you for this opportunity, Father. We pray that uh, this coming week uh, you would bless us, you would have us act, knowing that we've received, with nothing in our hands to bring, your salvation, your regeneration, that we've received Jesus in our hearts and our minds, that you would re continue to renew our, renew our minds and illuminate our minds, Father. Have us walk forth in faith, love, perseverance, contending for the faith in the face of a world that is challenging, Father. So we pray for patience, endurance, perseverance with ourselves and in your grace and those around us. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. i
seated. There's a temptation I'm not going to give into, but after the excellent exhortation, I'm, I'm tempted to just kind of pick up where he left off and keep going. It was, it was challenging. There's a warning in Jude, and if been able to delve a little more into some of those details. Jude is confronting a a problem in the church that the reprobate have infected the church. You know the doctrine of election, its opposite is the doctrine of reprobation. Jude describes them as those who are without the spirit, those who have been foreordained for judgment. He's describing what it means to be reprobate, and yet They have been welcomed into the church, and they have gained influence in the church. That verse really is a good verse, uh, the verse of the, the message. Keep yourselves in the love of God. And that really is where I want to introduce our meditation and our thoughts for the the Lord's Supper today. As I'm speaking, you may, if you have not gotten the element from the Elements from the back table, you may please do so. The scripture tells us of the time in which the Lord Jesus himself instituted the Lord's Supper on the occasion of the Passover, which he was celebrating with his disciples. From Mark's gospel, we read this. And as they were eating, he took bread and after blessing it, broke it and gave it to them and said, take, this is my body. And he took a cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to them, and they all drank of it. And he said to them, This is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Truly, I say to you, I will not drink again of the fruit of the vine until that day when I drink it new in the kingdom of God. What is the meaning of the supper? What is, what is its meaning and purpose Well, our shorter catechism asks the question, what is the Lord's Supper? And it answers, the Lord's Supper is a sacrament wherein by giving and receiving bread and wine according to Christ's appointment, his death is showed forth. And the worthy receivers are not after a corporal and carnal manner, but by faith made partakers in his body and blood with all his benefits to their spiritual nourishment and growth in grace. You should understand that, and let me put it in the context of the verse, the key verse today. Keep yourselves in the love of God, remain in the love of God. The Lord's Supper is a tool, it's an instrument, it's a way, a means that Christ has given to us to accomplish that very purpose, to remain in the love of God. As we take the elements and as we remember, and as in remembering, we embrace the gospel and embrace what Christ has done for us by faith. That's the key. You know, it doesn't matter. A lot of things we, we do about the administration of the Lord's Supper are good. They may serve a good purpose, but what is essential and what makes a worthy participant in the Lord's Supper is to receive it by faith. And when you are remembering Christ, you are also saying, he is my savior. He died for me. And through his death, my sins are forgiven. And this I believe. That's a worthy recipient of the supper. It's my privilege as a minister of Jesus Christ to invite all who are right with God and his church through faith in the Lord Jesus to come to the Lord's table. 
if you've received Christ and are resting upon him alone for salvation, as he is offered to you in the gospel, if you are a baptized and professing communicant member in good standing in the church that professes the gospel of God's free grace in Jesus Christ, and if you live penitently and seek to walk in godliness before the Lord, then this supper is for you, and I invite you in Christ's name to eat the bread and to drink the cup. At the same time, scripture warns us that whoever receives these elements in an unworthy manner is eating and drinking judgment to themselves, storing up judgment because you are profaning the table of the Lord and not receiving it in a worthy manner. But if you're not trusting Jesus today, I urge you, while I say, yes, on one hand, you should not participate, I always think it's important to say, but you should be challenged by what you have heard, what you have observed today in the worship service, and you should be challenged by the truths that are presented to you, challenged in such a way that you are moved to embrace Christ I noticed uh, earlier today they said there would be elders up front to take prayer requests. But you know what? If, you, if your prayer request is, Lord, show me the way of life, I'm sure the elders would be more than happy to talk to you about that. We live in a time when... Love is not flowing freely in our land. We live in a time where the heart of God's word is largely ignored and rejected. But we know from the scripture, because the scripture teaches us that the heart of the law of God is what? Love. The two great commandments are defined in the term love, to love God and to love your neighbor. And God doesn't just tell us to love. He also then shows us what it means to love. He teaches us what love is through the commandments. First four commandments, how we should love God. The last six commandments, how we should love our neighbor. Today, there's a different ethic that has taken over much of our culture. It's the ethic of critical theory. It's the ethic of neo-Marxism that teaches us to resent, to hate, to accuse each other. You've all read and seen stories of even school children being taught these ideas and being taught that based on the color of their skin or their ethnic racial background, that they are either victims or victimizers, and that there is guilt and you can never atone for your guilt, and that hatred and resentment is right. Compare that with the ethic of love that God gives us in his word. One is destructive, it tears apart, it divides, it pits one group against another and engenders hate. The other builds and hopes and forgives. I want to challenge you, which one will you follow? Which one will you teach your children? Which one do you embrace and confess? But there is a love that goes beyond the commandments. It is a love that redeems an enemy. It restores that enemy as a friend a love that takes the outcast rebel and adopts him into the family as a child of God. It is a love that abounds to the chief of sinners, and it is a love that took the only begotten Son of God to the cross. Listen to these verses. Romans chapter 5, 6 through 10. For while we were still weak at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. 
One will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person one might dare even to die. But God shows his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 1 John chapter 4, verse 9, In this the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. John three sixteen. Oh, you see this and you hear this all the time. And it's become so familiar that we, we, we think about it. We don't really think about it. We just read it and listen to it. But think of it. For God so loved the world. He loved the world in this specific way that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. And this is the love that we are reminded of today. This is the love that we are to remain in and keep ourselves in this love. We are remembering the love of God that saves us from our sins and restores us to God. This love took visible form in the person of Jesus Christ. This love actually accomplished salvation for his people. Please join me in prayer. We thank you, Lord, for the love of God that reaches from heaven, reaches down to earth, reaches from holiness to the unrighteous, plucking them out of the fire, as it were, taking away the sin and the guilt and restoring them to righteousness, a righteousness that is not our own, but is counted to us. Indeed, the righteousness of Christ imputed to us and we receive by faith. Lord, we praise you and thank you for the greatest act of love. It's an indescribable love beyond the capability of human language to express. And so, Lord, we pray now you would bless your people as we partake of this, these elements, and as we remember Christ, indeed communing with one another and communing with him as he, by his spirit, is among us right now. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Our Lord Jesus Christ, the same night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and blessed it and broke it and gave it to his disciples. In the same way, in the same manner, our Savior also took the cup And having given thanks, as we have done in his name, he gave it to his disciples. As I, ministering in his name, give this bread and this cup to you. Jesus said, in taking the bread, as we all do now, he said this, Take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And as we take the cup together, our Lord Jesus said, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for many for the forgiveness of sins. All of you drink of it. Again, please join me in prayer.
Father, in obedience to Christ, we have remembered him. And we have drawn near to the throne of grace. By faith, we embrace the gospel message, the good news, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And in this, the love of God is clearly made manifest, set forth before us. We pray, Father, for your blessing on us today and in the days to come. We pray for this church that it would remain and even increase as a beacon of light in a darkened world, as a place where those who, who seek salvation will come and find it abundant and free. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Brothers and sisters, it has been good to be in the house of the Lord with you this day. It has been good to hear the proclamation of the word. It has been good to remember Christ. It has been good to share in the fellowship of the saints. But now look up and receive the blessing of our God. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do his will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.
Daniel, the lone, the lone warrior. Are we online or no? Yeah, you're going to be. Okay. I'll fasten my seatbelt. And I am. Am I? I'm live. Yeah. I'm on. Yeah. Okay. You want me to see if I can put on my screen? We may at least still want to close the doors, though. Thank you. I can hear. Yeah, the ambient. Check one two. Little too hot. Little too hot. <laughs> You send an online question? <laughs> Why? We're here. Why what? You, you sent online questions? No, I said, are there online? Is the, oh. I didn't see the iPad. I was asking if you had the iPad. Yes, oh, two just showed up. Is it a laptop or iPad? There you go. It's a magic link. It's an iPad with the magic link on it. OK, are we, are we live? Never stopped, all right. Good afternoon, Daniel. Good afternoon. Um, well, for everyone online, this is Q&A. Yes. And uh, thank you, Aaron, for being here. And Bob is, was our exhorter today. And uh, we'll go to, yeah, in person first. Daniel, Daniel. Daniel. you. Uh, wow. Thanks, Don. <laughs> Would you please read that definition of heresy again? Yeah, um, I'm happy to. I, I cut it down a little bit for, um, and, I, and I found it actually on the Ligonier site where I caught it from. Uh -huh. Dr. Robert Godfrey was asked, how do you define heresy? This is what he said. It's a great question because the word heresy sometimes is thrown around by people. Some people use the word heresy simply to mean any error or fairly serious error in theology, but classically the word heresy was used to describe those theological errors so serious that it would deprive one of salvation. I think we ought to be using heresy more in that sense. Error is error. Error can be serious. Error can, error can be small. This is the part that I left out for uh, brevity's sake. Error is always bad and to be avoided, but there are some errors that are so huge they're really cutting us off from God because we have so misunderstood him and his truth. And that's what heresy classically was used for in the church. Do you agree with that? Um, based on my current understanding, yeah. I'm, I'm open to uh, correction if uh, a, an argument is put forth that would convince me based on scripture. Okay, good. <laughs> yeah, that's always good. That's always reassuring. Uh, all right, so let's see. When we go with what you talked about in terms of uh, what was entailed in contending for the faith, and you mm -hmm. listed off various activities of the church, would you elaborate on that, please, in terms of how, how, are, how do all of those activities in various ministries connect with contending for the yeah, faith? Yeah, so, um, and I'm not, a, I'm not a Greek scholar, so I don't know the Greek word, and, and so I'm... Uh, I'm um, a little bit behind the eight ball as far as that goes. And if, if I knew the Greek word and what that actually meant, it sounds like the best um, translation of that is contend. Okay, so then I took that, that word contend and to strive and to, um, to sh effort to stretch that whole, that whole uh, idea of contending is, is encompassed in that. And I just wanted to... Um, so I think contending for the faith, as Jude is talking about it, is contending for the faith once and for all delivered to the saints, contending against heresy. But I also, and maybe I took liberties on this, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, but um, I wanted to, as the church is one body, we are all contending for the faith in our various activities based on the fact that we are one body with many parts different stations in life, different functions, 
I think it's important that moms and dads that are teaching their children biblical truth and bringing them up in the fear and admonition of the Lord are contending for the faith, ultimately, because they are um, teaching their children how to defend the faith, how to have the proper worldview. That's one example. I also see uh, when we're singing, we're speaking God's truth. We're singing God's words. We're contending for the faith. I see the effort, that whole focus of this body of Christ that, and most of us are volunteers. Some are getting paid. Most of us are volunteers that are, we're all contending for the faith once we're all delivered to the saints in that same direction as one body. That's kind of was the, was the idea. So if I'm uh, taking liberties there, that's a possibility, but I wanted to, I think, I think moms get the short end of the stick sometimes. You know? I think they need, to, they need to be given credit for, for, for the job and dads. You know, uh, families. I think families are, our families are under attack. So I just wanted to more acknowledge that, that this is a, the body of Christ contending for the faith in different stations of life. I don't know, if, does that make sense? Yeah, I appreciate that clar clarification. And then to further clarify, you would say that the primary application is to contending for the faith against heresy. Yeah, in, a, in the apologetic heresy. sense, yes. Yeah, so polemics and... Apologetic. Okay. 100%. Yes. Right. Thank you very much. Yes. Appreciate your labors. Yes, sir. Go ahead, sir. Yes. How are you doing? I was just scratching my head. No, I, I have a question. How are you doing? Thank you for your exhortation. I thank, thank you. I really appreciate it. And uh, at first, I thought I had a concern because it took a while for you to get to what I consider the meat, which it has, you know, I think first, be, um, you know, especially when you mentioned intent fit for the faith and the fact that the, I would say the meat of this is dealing with a description of these. Basically, heretics. I don't know. Correct. I, yes, I, I, heretics. I was trying to find a word for it because I think it might be more than just a heretic, a, a, a very specific thing. And uh, uh, what I, as you know, I like to set up my questions a little bit. So bear with. Go ahead. I'll try yeah. to do it briefly. I try to get exhorted by certain people to be a little. I'll, I'll but, try. Uh, to, I'll do my but, best um, to answer your question I, for sure. As I, you know, I will. Hopefully, everybody knows I am open about maybe where I might disagree with Pastor Paul or. Sure. You know, and I, you know, I don't, I'm not hiding any of that. And, uh, and I, ha I have a suspicion there are certain people that have concerns about me and maybe, oh, they might even think, oh, he's one of those heretics, right? Really? But, well, okay, there might be a few. I, I'm not going to name names, but there, there's a few that uh, okay. do have a concern about me apparently. But what I wanted to point out and see this is yes. what my question is, is uh, from the description of these uh, heretics, for lack of any other term for using it, I would rather call them wolves in sheep's clothing, I would think, because mm -hmm. they're not coming out openly saying, hey, I, this is the false doctrine. Sure. This is where I disagree. Mm -hmm. They're coming in secretly. Yes. And, and I think there's a parallel passage, 2 Peter 2, mm -hmm. which says the same thing. Um, yes. Trying to secretly in, put in heresies. And one, two things it seems like they're doing, according to verse, uh, I always can't see, verse 4 here in Jude, uh, they're ungodly, mm -hmm. perverts the, they pervert the grace of, I guess these are the two... Uh, Heresies in particular, they pervert the grace of our God in, into, okay, my translation, I don't like this, indecency, but I believe it's lawlessness is the yes, actual okay. word. Basically, you know, they're, they're trying to say, hey, we're not under any law, right? I right. Think, of any sort. And then they also deny our master and Lord Jesus the Christ. Mm -hmm. And so I'm thinking, but they're all doing it secretly, I think, and that's the, the main key, I, I guess. Mm -hmm. And I'm wondering... How I would see it, like if I was going to try to infiltrate the church mm -hmm. to, to do these things, I would think I would agree outwardly with all the, what the church says and everything. Mm -hmm. And if I do say something that seems off, I'll quickly, no, that's not what I meant. I, I agree mm -hmm. with you guys. So I'm thinking, wouldn't you say that if we had a problem, and, I, and to be honest, I, I, um, I keep an eye open for heretics all the time because I've been from other churches where I've seen what I would consider a lot of activity in such a way. Mm -hmm such as this, I'm wondering if, as elders, wouldn't you say that this is, you would not necessarily look at people who are just openly disagreeing with you, but also keeping an eye out for those wolves in sheep's clothing? I'm wondering, any, any thoughts on that? On, because I mean, there are yeah, a description of, of these passages, but um, on... That's, that's a great any question. Any thoughts on that? That's a great question. First of all, um, the, in the commentary that I used, Second Peter and Jude are, are related... Um, very related. It, it looks like possibly Peter took 
possibly some from Jude, or mm -hmm. used Jude in order to write his epistle. There's, again, there's speculation about that, but um, at least there's a connection there. And I did bring out the point that Jude, um, in, in that verse 4, he, he uh, implies that they've weaseled their way in to the church. They've come in unnoticed. They're utilizing flattery. They're utilizing, uh, they're, they're propping other people up. They're kind of glad-handing people. And in that, they've come in unnoticed. And yes, to your point, um, then they've said, hey, come along down, down with me. You know, really, really, do we really need that? You know, really, we can do what we want to do. And, and they would turn the love feast into an ungodly act as it was happening in Corinthia. So yeah, um, I have to be alert in myself <laughs> for, for, wrong, for wrong ideas, <clears throat> wrong justification of myself, wrong teaching, wrong doctrine. Uh, we, are, we are vetted uh, as elders um, pretty thoroughly. And um, in our meetings, we correct each other. And we, we kind of go head to head sometimes, you know? And so uh, that's all good and that's all healthy. Iron sharpens iron. So I don't know if that answers your question. I would agree with you that yes, um, it was a, they were slippery. They were weaseling, you know, that's the intimation. It wasn't like, hey, believe this and let's go. It was, they were infiltrating the church. And what makes it seems like uh, especially difficult is that when uh, it seems like at least Jesus typifies a believer typically as a sheep, which yeah, is sure. the dumbest animal on the earth compared to goats, which are a lot smarter and they're the unbelievers. So it's almost like we seem to be at an disadvantage at even being able to do this, which is kind of interesting. Sure. But, uh, and that's, that's a good description. Wolves and sheep's clothing, yeah. I mean, that's an ap apt, apt uh, right. description, yes. You know, I was, I, yes, I go ahead. make a Please. comment, because you make, got me thinking about the, the unnoticed part. Unnoticed? Yeah, or, or secret, right? It says they come in unnoticed, you know, and, and I like to say no one has a t-shirt that says heretic and walks yeah, the door, all that, right. that guy, right? But what I thought was interesting is that um, what Jude's pointing out here, um, particularly in verse 8, he says, these dreamers defile mm -hmm. the flesh, yep. reject authority, mm -hmm. and speak evil of dignitaries. Mm -hmm. yeah. So I, I'm seeing two things going on here. One is a desire to be loose flesh-wise, mm -hmm. like a, a liberalness, mm -hmm. right? I, <clears throat> um, maybe Diana can remember this from reading Anna Karenina, but Oblonsky was a liberal simply because he wanted to live his life that way. He wanted to be loose in his marriage and that sort of thing. That's what I see going on here in the mm -hmm. same way. He wants to be a part of the church but have a lifestyle that was mm -hmm. open. But then also the big thing is rejecting authority. Mm -hmm. yeah. I see here a desire to, con to uh, compete with the apostolic authority or with the church authority mm -hmm. by speaking evil of them mm -hmm. and obviously fill it, wanting to fill the gap that's mm -hmm. left. Right, right. Um, and I think Jude here is is saying no. That's um, th this is a false faith, and mm -hmm. they're going to lead people astray. And mm -hmm. he's not saying this directly, but I, as an apostle, am going to mm -hmm. you know, tell you you got to contend for what's the real deal. Here. And and he goes back to the Old Testament and you Sodom and Gomorrah, yeah. and the sons of Korah and the Exodus generations. Like God has laid down His order, and these. These people are saying, no, we don't have to abide by that order. We don't have to abide by that authority. We don't have to abide by these boundaries that God has laid out. It's easy to come in and grumble about who's in charge. Sure and you can, get, you can get people on board that yeah, way, right? Sure. That's how revolutions start. They say, oh, it's these people. We've got to take these people yeah. out. This. And then he's, he's warning you about these. They're grumblers and complainers. They cause divisions, and they speak evil of people. And there's a Greek word for grumbling. I, I was listening to uh, a podcast the other day, and... Um, Dennis Wilson's going through uh, hermartiology, uh, naming sins, all the sins of the Bible. Yeah. And um, there's a Greek word for grumbling, but it was, it was it's, a, it's a sin, big time. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah. Yes, Just sir. a follow-up uh, on that. Um, one thing I wanted to also point out, I think it's Second Peter. I'm, I'm trying to find it right now. But, sure. But uh, I think it talked about secretly caused divisions, where, okay. you know, a lot of people like, when, right, right, thank you. Two lines. Two one, right? And uh, so <laughs> the encyclopedia. He's my Thank lawyer, no, and uh, sometimes. And uh, but I, I guess my concern is because I, I, I know, I think it's great we have our standards, right? Don't get me wrong. I uh, and I, I, I struggle with some, a few of the minor things, and I, I'm not. It's not 
any uh, secret, but, but I do appreciate the fact we have standards. But the thing is, I think it's kind of interesting that we look at, I look at some of the liberal Presbyterian churches, they have the same exact standards. And it's just kind of interesting, obviously somebody let them straight down to the point where we had to make a new denomination. I forget exactly when the Orthodox came. So wait, you're, I'm sorry. So you're saying that the liberal churches have the same exact stand, well, standards that we do? Well, so they abide by the Westminster maybe, Confession? or? Hmm? Well, that might be it. But I guess what I'm saying is they, they claim to have the same standards, right. and yet somehow they've, they've reinterpreted or, or ignored yeah, them yeah, or whatever sure. they're doing. And I guess maybe my personal concern is maybe down the line that would be, that would be one way these heretics might want to try to do things like by watering down or, or maybe, mm -hmm. like you were saying, uh, Daniel, or implying um, maybe adding more. Or it's a buffet. You pick and choose right, what you exactly, want. Right, exactly. Or, you know, yeah. which is always dangerous because we, we, <laughs> yeah. I think we walk in a, the midst of a problem of where, at what point can it become, I know legalistic is kind of a, maybe not the right word, maybe mm -hmm. pharisaic is a better word. Sure. It's not for salvation, but maybe adding more rules that yeah. are the traditions of man rather than God's word. And I think... We, we got to find that fine balance, and yet... <laughs> That's where the circumcision of the heart comes in. We are circumcised right, right. hearts. Right. You know, and it's not just about external circumcision, it's circumcision of the heart. Right, I totally agree. You know. All right, but I'm just saying it's Hopefully. like... Hopefully. I guess I'm just mentioning some of the ideas of concerning yeah, for the faith, and I think we may have different ideas of what that might amount to, so but I just wanted I, to... I think, no, I, yeah, it's good, good stuff. I appreciate it. Um, Anyone, well... Yeah, we can go online before we, we have... We will get to you, Daniel. Repeats. Thank you. I appreciate that. We, uh, we go around. Uh, yes. Is anybody else in... No? No, no other hands? Okay. Um, well, Daniel, why don't you go ahead with your... You have a follow-up? Okay. Go ahead. Yeah, go ahead. Before we go online. Sure. Since you are in the room. Thanks. I appreciate that. Uh, so can we look at two passages together in light of heresy? Sure. So let's start with the word itself, but let's start with Galatians 5, verse mm -hmm. 20. Galatians 5, verse 20. 5, 20. Okay. There we go. Okay. So you're I don't have my glasses, but go ahead. Your translation should read there, one, two, wait, 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 let's see. I, okay, now the works of the flesh are evident. Yeah. Sexual Im immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dis dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. Okay, I, so yes. right, divisions there is heresies, hot eresis. Okay. So notice that it's not qualified. Mm -hmm. And then if you'll go with me to 2 Peter 2, verse 1. Okay, hang with me. What is, what is it by not qualified, do you mean? If you, if you go with me to 2 Peter 2, verse 1, mm -hmm. the same word, hyurasis, which is bad Greek pronunciation, and I'm going to get roasted for it. 2 uh, Peter 2, verse 1. 1, 1. Uh, two verse one, sorry. Oh, two. Second Chapter Peter two, two. Yeah, verse, verse one. one. But false prophets mm -hmm. also arose among the people, just as there will be false teachers among you who will secretly bring in destructive heresies, even denying the master who brought them, bringing upon themselves swift destruction. So destructive there is damnable. So there's damnable heresies. And non-damnable heresies would be my understanding of comparing Scripture with Scripture there, with all due respect to Dr. Godfrey. Um, I'd have to look into that further. I'd have to think about it. That would be my encouragement to you because you encouraged me to bring Scripture, and I appreciate that. Of course. Yeah, uh, I, I'll, I will. I will. I'm, uh, I'm un unclear. Was, so, there, was, was there something in Godfrey's so, quote that said there's one heresy or some, so some it, are better what, than what, others? So what uh, Godfrey was saying was there's error and heresy. Error will not damn you. Heresy okay. will damn you. Heresy is a false is such a false understanding of God and His Word that you you will you will you're on your way to perdition. So that's what that sounds like here too. Not just error, but heresy is what's here also. Right. So he's using a different word for error, as in like I may just not know the right thing about something you teach it to me. Right. And right. 
right. that's that's sanctification right, right. and also so. i mean to me it's like okay the the, the four elements that, that pastor paul talks about yeah. when we become members yeah. that's that's the christian faith yeah. if you're in that circle yeah, yeah right so that's yeah. that's the qualification of what it means to be a christian what outside that circle you're 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 probably you're probably inherit i think he would say you're 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 outside of the true Christian faith. So what, what was the point that you're making there with the so qualifications? I, so, I'm, I missed it here. So I'm, what I'm hearing is heresy can be damnable or not damnable, is Correct. what you're saying. Correct. So heresy is a wider, uh, has a wider definition than heresy that Godfrey is saying. Proved by Galatians 5.20 where it's listed as a sin but not qualified as damnable. That word damnable, or I think you have destructive in your translation, is very strong. Okay. Very strong qualifying word. So uh, we can look at other examples as well. So for example, the word where we get it, right? Hierasis, you can hear it, heresy, right? It, that's where we get the word from. And uh, it basically is a disunion. So there are ways that you disunite yourself from the official doctrine of the church without being damned. For example, some of our brothers and sisters potentially in the room, they might not agree with the church's teaching on the Sabbath day. They might not agree with it, but that's, we would never say that's damnable. But it is contrary to the official doctrine of the church. Uh, I, I'll look into that further. I'll yeah. think about it. I appreciate you know? that. Yeah, no problem. Um, yeah, interestingly enough, it says here, um, you know, those who practice such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. With all these sins listed here. That, that's in um, uh, Second Peter. In Galatians, no, in Galatians, uh, Galatians. five twenty. Yeah. So yeah, so. So that that would imply that it is damnable. If they do not inherit, inherit the kingdom of God, I mean these are these are works of the flesh that are listed here. Right. Right. So these are people who practice such things. Right. So therefore, that would so be it's, damnable. It's a, yeah. It's 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 these are things that damned people do when we put right. it that way. Right. I, I mean I don't know if we're we're conflating the cause and the effect here. Sure. Well, every sin is so, damnable, right? We would right. agree. Correct. So, of course, in a sin list, they're all damnable, but. There's, you know, there's a word like heresiarchos, right? Archos, a heresiarch, a teacher of heresy. Okay. That's different than merely practicing heresy. Okay. So there's, there's different uses of heresy. And with all due respect to Godfrey, I mean, you can look it up in the 1828 uh, dictionary. It, doesn't, it, it says where there is an established religion, it contradicts that church's doctrine. So this is, the, I don't know what he means by the classical definition is, Okay. Soul damning heresy. So, the the way that we have been accustomed to speak of it as, as far as I know in the Reformed Church, is soul damning heresy versus heresy. Oh. Right? So, if we were to say, if we were to say an elder uh, taught against the confession in a non salvific area, mm -hmm. we wouldn't say that he taught a damnable heresy. At least right. I don't think we would. But right. we would say if we're using it in the older sense, and if we're using it in the sense that I think it's listed as in Galatians five twenty. We would say he taught a heresy. He taught, you can soften it to error. If we all stipulate that errors are non-soul damning heresies and heresies are only soul damning heresies, then we've just redefined the terms. And that may be what, but that's not classical. That's so, why so, I object so to, to get, God let, me, let me just kind of cut to the chase here. Yeah. I appreciate your, your, your diving, drilling down into this. Bottom line is you got to have a correct understanding of the word of God, who God is, who we are, who Christ is, and what he's done for us. Period. If you don't have that, you're, you're a reprobate. If you do have that, you're saved. Correct? So whether um, we define it, uh, wait, yes or no? Uh, I wouldn't you, say a reprobate. You're, you're, you're on, unless you're saved at the end, unless, unless God, yeah, unless, tell, we can't read people's hearts. But you do have to have, you do have to have profess with your mouth and believe in your heart that Jesus is Lord. That's clear. You have to believe certain things. You have to have so so whether you're it's heresy, error, heresy, damnable heresy. My point is you got to know what yeah. you got to know what, what the teaching is. Yeah, and we're all right. And I think that so I think that's the most important thing. Yeah, and, we're and all I will look into your 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 categorization of this and the use of the word. Um, I like I said I'm not a Greek scholar. And so you, you know more about Greek than I do, and I, I appreciate that. It's all Greek to me. So, uh, <laughs> But, uh, yeah, I think we're all agreed, right, that although every error is serious, we want to treat 100%, all which, errors which seriously. Which is what Godfrey says. Yeah, not every single sin or error is 
um, alike grievous unto God, right? So yes, they're all the same ontically. They all cause us to fall. They all cause us to be damned. They're all damnable in that sense, but they're not all to the same degree of severity, yes? So that yes, would apply you, to errors of the mind as well as errors of so life. So just to simp again, simplify things so it's understandable. If you're in the circle of the four things that Pastor Paul talks about, we all agree that that's the Christian, the faith. Those are the elements of the faith. And if you're outside of that circle, you're not in the faith. If you can't answer yes to the four questions, he says. You, you can't answer yes to the four questions. Our church, the Reformed doctrine, believes that you are not in the faith. That's why we ask those four questions of every member, correct? Yes, and you okay. would agree that they could potentially be outside of the faith if they break vow five as well, if they don't hold yeah. to it. Yeah, because yeah. oh, that has to do with our church. That has to do with our church. Yeah, but you could But be, as a Christian, you've got to believe those four things. So anyway, I'm, I'm, we're kind of, I'm, I, I appreciate your drilling down, but I do want to move on. Okay, thanks. Thank All you. Right. We have Thank a, you. We have and new, I, will, I will look into it. We do have a new question, Diana. Hey, Diana. Uh, thank you for your exhortation, Bob. Thanks, uh, Diana. I wanted to ask, kind of going on a totally different uh, path with mm -hmm. with my question here, but um, in your uh, Christian faith and then in your life, uh, can you uh, tell us what has been the most consistently the most encouraging thing to you as far as a portion of scripture or something that you've learned, but something that you know you can track that that has always brought you great comfort. comfort i mean separate from obviously christ elect christ election but i mean something yes. more practical that you found very encouraging uh, and strengthening to your faith and in your life i appreciate that question uh proverbs 3 was one of the first um there's we, the reason i chose it today uh proverbs 3 1 through 8 was one of the first um passages i heard when i became a believer that really kind of resonated with me uh, lean not on your own understanding, and that idea, and but on every, thank you, every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. So the way it was described to me and the impact it had on me was, if I'm leaning on my own understanding, and again, Daniel, forgive me, I'm taking, I'm using my imagination here in speculation, okay, but it's, it's, okay. it's, it's, it's metaphor, it's not, so... It was described to me that, say, for instance, 2,000 years ago, you're walking in the desert, and everybody had a staff, and you're leaning on that staff, and you're leaning on a hollow staff, and that staff is not going to be able to uphold the weight of my leaning on it, especially me at 215 pounds, okay? It will, it will collapse under my weight. That's my own understanding. The rock, God's word, if I lean on that, if I lean on the rock of God's word and his promises, that, that will be able to withstand the weight. And then I think about Francis Schaeffer and talk, talking about uh, Western culture and his history, uh, his analysis of, of Western culture and uh, how then should we live, and talking about he, would, he, would, he had that um, metaphor of the bridge, the Roman bridge that could sustain the weight of a horse, and a carriage, but it couldn't withstand the weight of a semi. And when the yeah. weight of the evil of a culture got too great, it collapsed, and everything and everything just fell apart. So mm -hmm. that, to me, is encouraging. When I when I, I try, I kind of go back to that, and that's why I picked that that proverb. It's kind of one of the first things I heard. So that's you know a reminder, you know, to to. Uh, and there's, there's many passages. That's a great question. Uh, I, I'll have to meditate on that. I try to read scripture, well, I, I mean, every day, at least a couple chapters every day. Then there's maybe a book that I read um, as well and uh, pray through that. And there's, there's so many of them. But um, this one popped out at me. When I was reading Jude, I was going through my reading, and I was like, wow, Jude 2021. 20, that's interesting. And Pastor Paul's always talked about, hey, if you're trying to choose a verse to... Uh, as elders to preach on, what speaks to you? Mm -hmm. You know, you'd be reading, and then I was like, "Wow, that has a lot in it right there." That was very. That was so. Anyway, that's why I picked that out. It, it spoke to me, you know. Um, so, yes, sir. Oh, 
I'm sorry, you're in, you're in charge here. I'm calling on Jerry. No, okay. you're oh. in charge. Okay, Jerry, go ahead. You can Approach, Jerry, yes. <laughs> so, so, someone else can go in front of me, that's okay. Um, thank you, Bob, for your exhortation. Sure. I especially appreciated your, um, your encouragement to, um, <clears throat> to build and to have faith and to wait uh, to pray. Um, my question is related to kind of a little bit of discussion here, and um, Pastor Pontier also kind of mentioned the word um, reprobate. Mm -hmm. um, I'm not that familiar with it, and I don't use it in my normal parlance. Right. Um, mm -hmm. It's not a word I normally use. I usually think of save and unsaved. Sure. And so, um, but I've also been at meetings where people pray for the reprobate, mm -hmm. which kind of confuses me because... I thought reprobate meant God has already deemed them unsaved. Mm -hmm. And it's a designation from God. It's not something I can tell. Mm -hmm. uh, and if it's God's will that they've already been unsaved, um, mm -hmm. it seems contradictory sure. to That's pray true. for that. Mm -hmm. And yet, uh, I'm not sure what Pastor Pontier said, but he made a contrast between the saved and the reprobate. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm... I'm confused about That's a great the word question. and the use of the word, and yeah. are we using it appropriately? Because yeah. um, anyway, yeah. if you could elaborate on the word and maybe how. Um, I'm not sure how much I can elaborate on it. I'd, I'd be good, interesting to do a word study. Let's well, see. I, I think that there's, I don't think it was meant, maybe I'm going out of line here, but I don't think it was meant that we now know the mind of yeah. God that this person is sure. permanently damned. I think it simply means they're not in the fold right now. Mm -hmm. You're either an adopted son or you're, Ill, you know, you're outside. Mm -hmm. um, I think that's what was meant. And so then we can pray for, I, I think unsaved and reprobate are synonymous in this case. Are, are synonymous, just like adopted and saved would be the same. It's, it's, it's has on, to Daniel. do with the, the child, the status in or out of the family. Well, uh, no, I think it's a matter of um, status in the church and what they profess, right? So I have, I know people who, who will tell you they do not believe in God. So I don't need any more evidence than that. They are saying with their own words, they are not Christians. And yet there may be a point at which... That is reprobation. Yeah. They may, that may change, right. but that is reprobation. So... Hang on, Daniel. Hang on. Uh, hang so, on. Yeah, I guess since you're not on the mic. We'll get to you. Yeah. No. So um, hang, on, hang on, guys. So you, you have to make a profession of faith to... to, to you're, you're, are you saying that everyone who has not made a profession of faith can be, is categorized as a reprobate? That's kind of what I'm Well, hearing. we went back to the, like you mentioned, the four questions, right? Mm -hmm. If someone's not willing to say yes to those four then they are, they are saying that they are not in the faith. They, they may say other things like, well, maybe I'm open to it one day, or it's kind of interesting, or I'd like to hear more about it, or maybe I'll attend church one day. Yeah, this is, this is a great, this is a great yeah. discussion. It, it really is, uh, and, I, and I understand your confusion, so we're trying to, trying to think through this together. Um, you know, we, Paul talks about vessels of mercy and vessels of wrath. Same kind of, same kind of thing. There's... I pray that I am a vessel of mercy. I, 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 I think I am. I hope God sees my heart. And, and I, can, I have some assurance that I am humbly stumbling, even as I did yesterday with a guy I knew for 35 years. I mentioned it at the beginning. I was, I was preparing for this sermon. I'm thinking, okay, here I am, preparing for this sermon as an elder. And I acted like that. You know, thank you very much, Mr. Christian, right? <laughs> you know, and, and whether I was justified in my reaction or not, I could have handled it in a different way. So um, I, my point is I, but hopefully my conscience is tender enough to go, okay, you know, Lord, I, I offended you, and I offended, and I didn't represent you very yeah. well in this situation. So to me, that's a hopeful sign of assurance that I'm repenting. Um, 
So I'm hopeful I'm a vessel of mercy. And I pray for this person that right now, I see him, he's a vessel of wrath. I hope, I pray that he will come to faith, that he will, um, uh, you know, bow the knee to Christ. Is he reprobate in the ultimate sense? I don't know. That's not for me to see. A Spurgeon says, hey, we don't know who has the yellow stripe on people's backs. We don't have the x-ray vision into people's hearts. And I guess, I guess that's really the bottom of my question is when I, heard the, when I hear the word reprobate being applied to someone yes. in today's life, it, yeah. it touches to me an unkind attitude mm. and an uncompassionate attitude. If we're to be loving and kind mm -hmm. and patient and praying for someone's salvation mm -hmm. and yet at the same time calling reprobates, which is really only God's, mm -hmm. to me, the way I understand the word, and right. maybe that's my confusion, to apply the word reprobate to someone, it seems like I'm not, I'm not anywhere to judge that. That's God's decision to call someone a reprobate, yeah, yeah, not I, mine. I, and maybe that's where I'm confused because yet, my attitude as a Christian is mm -hmm. to be loving and kind and bring the gospel to them, not call them reprobates. And, and well, and then but but the word is used in scripture. Well, no, no, yeah. it it yeah, is. So it's, it, it, the word exists and the word applies. Right. It's just I'm saying me as a Christian. I agree. Am I really without you know to judge someone as a reprobate because that it implies right. knowing the mind of God. And that, that's kind I, of where I, I'm I get, having. I, I get what you're saying. In humility, I understand that. I'm, I'm um, I would have to listen to um, uh, Alan's, uh, you know, sermon again, or his mini sermonette again, mini sermon and listen again, and yeah. listen to it within the context and see how how he how he used it to really I, kind I, of think I through take it. Take it back. I don't think he said anything offending. I'm just right. saying. I, it. It just kind of the word has been thrown around. Right. No, I think we have to be careful with our language. That. I mean, our, what does James say? Our, 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 our tongue is set on fire by the flames of hell. I know it. Yesterday, boom, done, you know? Um, so, I, you know, uh, yes. So we do have to, you, to your point, you, we do have to be careful. Yes, I agree. We yeah, I, I think there's, there's, there's two things here, though. There's, there's the manner, and then there's the data, mm -hmm. right? Sure. And I, I, I appreciate what you're getting at as far as um, not being pejorative. You know, we're yeah. supposed to be uh, approachable and persuasive at the same time. I did have some sort of x-ray vision into myself mm -hmm. being an unbeliever until I was 21 years of age. I remember what sure. I thought, and at times thought that I was okay with God. Mm -hmm. And I would have hated for someone to look at me and say, hey, that guy's all right. I, he doesn't need the gospel. Mm -hmm. That kid's okay. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to say that I was a reprobate. The Bible says that I was alienated from God, vain mm -hmm. in my own understanding, mm -hmm. separated yeah. forever, condemned, such as were all of you, yeah. right? The Bible does not hold back any punches, and I sure. would absolutely say that I was a reprobate before God mm -hmm. saved me, and that was the beauty of His grace sure. and His mercy. So it's really important that we recognize that in people because I think we, we, we can't evangelize them if we don't really realize that. Does that, does that kind of make sense? And I, I, it didn't mean that someone had to come in with a club and hit me or something mean. Really reprobate, though. That would be my question. No, What's that? No, you were not. You predestined to damnation. You called yourself reprobate at 21, but were you really reprobate? Well, there's, again, there's two different definitions of the word going on here. If, if, if reprobation means that they were, uh, this is something only God knows, then the word's useless to us. Right, because we can't use it anywhere. We can't describe anyone with it if it has meaning at all. That would hold true for election too, then, because it's only known to the mind of God. Well, no, it's a subset of election. Reprobation is the inverse of election. You are not appointed to destruction. The passage you're, you're, that was mentioned is fitted to destruction. The vessels of wrath fitted or made up to destruction. You are not a vessel of wrath fitted to destruction. Here, let's let's go to the verse I was I was referencing here. Now, where is that? I mean, the confession only speaks of reprobation in contrast to election. It does not speak of sinners as reprobate. I'm sorry. I don't know anywhere in the larger catechism or shorter catechism or confessions, hey, where reprobate is used of anyone who is not eternally damned. So what you're saying, Daniel, is 
is reprobation refers to those that are vessels of wrath predestined by God in his eternal plan. Yeah, whether you're in prolapsarian or a superlapsarian, whether you believe that they were appointed to destruction out of the fallen mass of humanity, mm-hmm. or whether you believe they were appointed to destruction before the foundation of the earth. That's okay. what reprobation is. All right, if that is, if that is the... Uh, where is it in the... Um, Confession. So, chapter 33.2, section 2. Okay. The, the end of God's appointing this day is for the manifestation, by the way, this is of the last judgment. So, 33.2. The end of God's appointing this day, that is of the last judgment, is for the manifestation of the glory of his mercy in the eternal salvation of the elect and of his justice in the damnation of the reprobate who are wicked and disobedient. For then shall the righteous go unto go into everlasting life, excuse me, and receive the fullness of joy and refreshing, which shall come from the presence of the Lord. But the wicked who know not God and obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ shall be cast into eternal torments and be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. And it's not used anywhere else. It's used in... Uh, Hang on. It's used in providence of God's, or sorry, of God's eternal decree. Well, yeah, okay, but as far in as... In terms um, of scripture. Yeah. So by I mean, the if, ch- that's, if that's the case, if we have this the definition as, as election, then sure, it's inappropriate. That's why Jerry's confused. Okay. With all due respect. Then, it, then it, I mean, I can't speak for Alan or what he intended to say, but... So if can, that's the definition of whether someone's elected or not. Right. Pastor Frontier, from my memory, contrasted it with the elect. There's no problem. Good. Okay. Yes. It's it's yeah. a great question. And, that, and I mean, a, and that's and that's good. It's good you're, you're bring that up. Then I'll be you know careful because my my understanding of the word was just simply mean to be alienated from God, as it is as it explains in uh, Colossians, uh, one. Yeah, yeah. And I, and I know where you were probably coming from, too. And, and it's scary to think that somebody who does not present the gospel to you because you're, you're presenting yourself as being perfectly fine. Right, as right. As a person going right. to heaven, and it's great. Yeah. But in reality, they need to hear the gospel. So we have, we have to have a kind of a, a, a heart for that and try to get through that. And that's a hard thing to recognize, whether they have like the Paul James kind of faith. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right, right, yeah. So, so we have to, yeah, we can, we, you know, we have to address the what we see externally, mm-hmm. and when we don't know what the last judgment has, mm-hmm. clearly. So, if that word is reserved for the last judgment, then so for, be it. for for me, it's interesting. It's like when I, when I mention the gospel or mention God or mention church or anything, and if there's that, that that kind of that silent pushback, yeah. or that that quiet. Nice and not, not thinking about what I said and taking it to heart, but it's like a bad smell to somebody. Yeah. I know that, okay, yeah, they, these, these, these people are not, and I need to pr- continue to pray. Yeah. These people are not in the faith, even whatever they say they are, you know. Um, I, I don't know. I don't know if you guys experience that. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, but just hang on just a second, Arnie. Is there anything online that we need to get to? Oh, well, we do have some online ones. Hang on just a second. Okay. Um, <laughs> would you please clarify what you meant when you prayed that God would activate the Holy Spirit in us? Well, good question. You know, um, the Holy Spirit lives in us as Christians. Um, I can grieve the Holy Spirit through my actions, through my thoughts, through my behavior. And I pray that the Spirit would fill me when I'm speaking, when I'm living. And so it's maybe it's a, a um, I'm not sure if it's a, a, a wrong word to say, but uh, the Spirit lives within me as a Christian, and I'm not in this walking in the Spirit all the time. I can tell you that. 
So I pray for the guidance and the illumination and the renewing of the mind that the Spirit will impart to me, and that's, to me, activation. So I'm not sure if that's clear or not. Just a, I guess, a, a modern term, like activating your Act, car activate, alarm or yeah. something. Yes. Um, <laughs> and, you know, fill me with the Spirit. Activate yeah, the Spirit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, acknowledge, I think it's an acknowledgement that I'm not filled with the Spirit yeah. 100% all the time. Obviously, I'm not. <laughs> I wonder. I wonder if there's there's kind of a because um, the one of the hymns that we sing was um, I need thee every hour. Yes, sure. And um, it kind of talk. We know God's always present, but then it, it uses the language of kind of when you're there and when you're not there. And mm -hmm. we know that um, you know God turned His face away from Christ on the mm -hmm. cross. So there's that kind of mm -hmm. constant. That, is that kind of where. I'm feeling that tension. So, sort of, that's sort of along the same lines as, to, I mean, it's not like the Holy Spirit is out of you for no, a moment. No, but I can it's, grieve it's, him. I can grieve can him. Grieve I, can, him. I, can, I can almost, it, he's God. He's not going to be, I can't suppress him in my will, but he, I can grieve the Holy Spirit. And he's you, a and person. You, yeah. And that's, that's biblical. I can grieve him. And by walking, by, by reading, prayer, fellowship, all the things we talked about, I can keep myself in the love of God through activating the Spirit. I don't know if that's the right word, but, but through these behaviors, I will be more filled with the Spirit and I will be more sanctified if I can continue in that focus and that effort in that direction. And it takes effort. Maybe the issue with the word activate is that, like I said, it'd be like, like activating your TV set. Like sure. You're, like you're in charge and you're turning a machine on. Sure. I don't think that's what you meant by the use of no, the I, word. No, I, okay. I didn't. I could use it. Maybe I won't use that term from now on. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for calling me out on that. Yeah. No problem. Okay. Um, yes. We have one more. Go we'll ahead. Just knock them out. Go Would ahead. you please state who you believe to be the human author of Jude? Jude? I think it would be Jude. Yeah, yeah I, I, you know, that's a great, that's a great question. Um, you know, in any, all, all of the Bible, there's a scholarship of who wrote the Bible. and, I think and the first verse. Here. And um, Jude. who was Jude, half-brother of Christ, um, based on the commentary I read. And again, my knowledge isn't extensive. I got a lot to learn. But based on what I read, which I think was a solid Reformed commentary on Jude, and it's also got Second Peter in that commentary, I believe that Jude was was the author. Um, he self-identifies himself in the epistle, unless it's a forgery. I don't think it was a forgery. I think that I think that um, you know the apostolic and the the um, the, the uh, vetting process that Scripture has gone through, the sixty-six books, the councils. I trust that. I trust that, and I trust that Jude was the author. And yeah. if somebody brings incontrovertible evidence to that against it. Okay, I'll look at it, but good luck. We're talking about 2,000 years ago, and the best scholars, the best minds have looked at it and said, you know what? This is Jude. Yeah. All good questions. Thank you for that. Senor, adelante. Um, this is probably going to muddy the waters here, but I think it's important because oh. it's the scriptures. But because um, I was thinking the scripture for Jerry in terms of yes. uh, when you look at uh, Matthew 18 and 1 Corinthians 5, it talks about <clears throat> procedure of how to deal with uh, sounds like unrepentant people, right? Mm -hmm. and, right. Uh, and, but what's interesting is uh, 1 Corinthians uh, 5, I, I, you know, at first when I read it, I didn't notice this, but uh, first off, it sounds like we're supposed to treat um, unrepentant uh, believers, or whether or not they're believers or not, we treat them as unbelievers, basically, mm -hmm. uh, you know, um, or, or reject them. But what's, what's also kind of interesting is two things that I think is where I would be interested in your opinion. Um, one, which seems a little more clear, it says remove the evil person from among yourself. So mm -hmm. I, I, if I understand Pastor Paul correctly, if we excommunicate somebody, they're still welcome here, which I think... That, except they can't take communion, which I think, if I understand that, 
1 Corinthians 5, they shouldn't be even allowed in here at all, and we're certainly not to eat with them. Well, it's, yeah, that's, that's mm. good. So we want, we want them, to, I mean, the ultimate we goal We do of want them to know the gospel. If is, it says is to, to repent. Remove them from us. It seems right. like. Uh, and yet maybe, they, you know, were these people, some of the people that were uh, infecting the church and infecting right. and, and influencing people and, 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 and causing divisions among the I mean, the like, flock. for example, I thought if I was excommunicated, I mean, maybe I shouldn't say this because it gives some other idea, people ideas, but I'm thinking but, about bringing my own uh, uh, wine and bread, you know, and, mm -hmm. and, and how are you going to stop me from doing that unless you just kick me out of the room? But, you know, would I be kicked out? I, I would be in, <laughs> actually kind of interested to see that, but <laughs> I'm terrible, but okay. But um, the other thing that's kind of weird is about that passage is that uh, it says, I wrote to you in my letter not to associate with sexually immoral people. I did not mean all uh, with sexually immoral people of this world or with the greedy and swindlers or the idolaters, for then you would have to leave the world, which sounds like, um, let's say we did kick somebody, it's almost like contradiction, but on one hand, let's say we kick somebody out for these reasons, yet we could, well, no, I'm sorry, it's a little different. It's uh, hmm. like the unbelievers, let's say they're, they, they never profess faith in Christ. It sounds like we could still have some limited fellowship with them, but, but well, the ones we actually uh, do kick out it sounds like we treat them even worse than a reprobate. Does that so make let's, sense? Let's, so let's define fellowship. Um, well, Daniel, it's certainly would, not in Christian fellowship. So how would you? I mean, let's define it. Where there's fellowship, well, have, there's have friendly, I, there's yeah. friendly relations. Yeah, like and there's yeah. and there's fellowship. There's koinia. I do know one Greek word, Daniel. Koinia. <laughs> um, so, uh, but there's koinia, and that's fellowship amongst Christians, is what is what my understanding is. But it actually says, but actually, as I wrote to you not to associate with any so-called brother if he is sexually immoral person or a greedy person or idolater or mm -hmm. is verbally abusive. It sounds like you're not even to eat with such a person. And it goes, up, I didn't finish the whole list of things, but mm -hmm. it, it sounds to me that it's a stricter judgment on how we treat people that have, um, we've um, effectively excommunicated or, or that, you know, I mean, that profess to be a believer rather than just a mm -hmm. straight out unbeliever. That's, you see where I'm going with that confusion about? So, so they're, they're really very, being very hypocritical. In that sense, if if, if they say they're a believer, right, no, no, and they're they're behaving this way, right, which that's is, obviously a hypocrisy and not repenting, right. and not going, hey, right. you know, wow, and I I'm guess sorry. My, point, my point is that we, yeah, we treat them as an unbeliever. I think that's the passage, but it sounds like, if I understand the passage, it's almost like worse, because we're not going to, if an unbeliever comes to his church, I don't think we're going to kick them out. Just you know, we want them to hear the gospel. And mm -hmm. that, but if sure. it's somebody we actually kicked out before, it almost sounds like we should not have him. You see my argument for that? So, so isn't there, isn't, and, and uh, if there's, get, the passage I know is, is, is in my brain, but I, I can't think of it now. Something to the effect that it's, it's actually worse to, be, to be, proclaim faith and fall away from the faith right, right. than it is to just kind of be ignorant. Isn't there, isn't there a passage in there somewhere? And, and I'm... I'm Correct me if I'm wrong. I think there's, they're both bad, right. and and if the person doesn't repent, who's the believer but acting hypocritically and doesn't repent, he was never with us to begin with, right? right. Based on his behavior, based on his lack of repentance, based on his humility, and the lack of humility, based on his acknowledging Christ as not just Savior but Lord, obeying Him. So. I, I, I'm, I'm wondering if, if what you're touching on is whether, so I think we can all agree about someone being on the role or not. On the what again? On, a, on the church role. Oh, right, right, right. Membership, yeah. right? right. So if, if they're not a believer, they shouldn't be on the role, right? right. So we're, we're there. We're, we're, then the question is, should they be sitting here in a chair right. on Sunday morning? Should they be eating lunch with us? Correct. Right, that's kind of what you're what, going yeah. I'm I'm wondering now if this is a matter of, because these things here have the potential to be disruptive and distracting. Mm -hmm. And so if you have mm -hmm. somebody who is like a, a, a reviler, mm -hmm. like you cannot have service right. without yeah. them standing up. You can't up expect and, them to maybe cause some trouble. Right? If, there's, if there's some reason that they have to be maybe physically excluded, perhaps that's what's going on. Or if they're sexually immoral to, to the extent that they're destroying families or mm -hmm. something and people don't feel safe. Yeah. These, yeah, these yeah. kinds of things. Yeah. I think maybe come into that, whereas if someone is going to come in here, sit here, and, and submit, even though they don't believe, you know, there's no reason, right, on, on the surface to say you're not, 
welcome to sit here, even if you've been here before. If you're going to sit here and submit to the to the to listening and not be and disruptive, you're have lunch and not be disruptive. Yeah, I, I get your argument, but I have the problem where it says last verse of chapter five: remove the evil person from among yourselves. It's like it's does it seems pretty darn clear. It's like uh, whether or not they're submitting or not. If there's a certain category, it sounds like they're not supposed to be with us. That's you see where my concern is or issue. Yeah, we do. We have the disciplinary process. Right. No, unless there's an immediate. Yeah, right. Well, he's not getting, I don't think he's not getting to the process. So that's the, that is the uh, process for having someone excommunicate, which means removed from the roles. I think Arnie's concern is whether they should be in the building or not. Mm. Is that what, like physically around? Is that what you mean by association? I think the scripture says that if they've been excommunicated, they can't sit with us anymore. That's what I think it says. It doesn't say that. What are your... the person or people from your midst. Do we desperately want them under the preaching of the word? That's not in the Bible. I'm quoting the Bible. You know what, Arnie? I'm going to have to think through that a little bit. I appreciate the question. Yeah, his his crux here. I'd like to... No, no, it's a good question. It's a a good question, and it's a good point. I appreciate you you bringing that up. If somebody lends a legitimate argument, if somebody's told by the elders that they've been through the process and then they just pass out and they're like, he's well aware of that person. Yes. Yeah, and, I, and, and there, I mean, there was, I remember one example, I remember one example of, I've been here, I don't know, 12, 13 years, I remember one example of a gentleman coming in and um, standing at the back and being disruptive and, um, and being threatening mm-hmm. to a certain extent. And we had, he had to be removed because there was an imminent threat. Yeah. Um, and, th- and that, so... Whether he was evil or not, or mentally unstable, whatever, he had to be removed because of his, of his threat. Yeah, there was, there was a clear and present danger, you know. So I don't know if that relates to this passage. Well, that's, he's, made, yeah. he's made the announcement that that person has been outside because they believe a different gospel. Yeah. Then you've already warned the, the Christians mm. that that's right. the gospel. So if you're sitting here hopefully hearing the gospel and entertaining them, that's not a bad thing. So yeah, I think Paul's main concern here is that the distinction has to be made yeah. as to who is in the visible church or not. Yeah. Right, and then also keeping the contending for the faith, mm-hmm. we have to be doing both of those things. We have to continue to draw that distinction. Mm-hmm. And, and if we allow people who practice these things to be considered as part of our love feast, if you will, then that's when we start, for sure, start to err. Mm-hmm. So whatever we need to do to do that, right. yeah. Arnie, is that kind of discussion um, answer or yes, no? Well, I think it's inter- I guess my point is I hear mm-hmm. a lot of people arguing and good arguments, but mm-hmm. I, I, I go back to Scripture like mm-hmm. we're supposed sure. to, right? And I'm, I struggle with that because it's a weird passage and it sounds yeah. clear, you know? I mean, you know, why don't we, yeah, we can. I don't want to belabor this, but I thought it's an interesting. Okay. Point. Yeah, no, it's we'll good, take it's a look point. at it. We can maybe do it good for point. next week, too, and we have our trained yeah. professional, Pastor Paul. Yes, 100%. 
Uh, Melissa, you had. Hey, a, Melissa, how are you? Thank you. Thank you, you know. Oh, thanks. And um, I'm fortunate to have my wife to um, read it to three or four times and to go, is this making sense? How does this sound? She's like, eh, you know, all good here, but that sentence, okay, thank you. So I'm, I'm, it was great to be able to bounce that off of her, but Aren't thank they, you for that. They're just great about that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, uh, she happened to be walking in with us, and I asked, "Is Bob ready?" And she's like, "Oh, he's been practicing." <laughs> I'm like, "Cool." Yes, yes 100%. hundred <laughs> percent. Hmm. Hmm. And they gave they came up and gave me two big hugs right afterwards. That was so sweet. That was really that's that was the that was that's all the reward I needed right there. That was great. That was great. Love it. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Yeah. That uh, that story also of your house in Mexico. That was that was really a good analogy to add in there about the foundation. I'm telling you. I'm telling you, man. It was uh, a lot of a lot of anxious That's nights. That's kind of all you had was the foundation. Yeah, yeah the foundation. <laughs> you know. This thing that leaks, so at least it won't go anywhere. Yeah, it's <laughs> not going anywhere. Tsunami, whatever. It's going to stand firm. And it was a two to three year process to get it back up and but you know, and then thankfully Linda came along and did version three point I had several of the the walls were different colors, you know, and she's like, you know, we gotta kinda pull this thing together, honey. Oh, uh, that's funny. Yeah, we gotta, that's you know really funny. drapes and a little bit a little we need a little little makeover here, you know. Yeah. So anyway, everything was functioning but it didn't really work. <laughs> so she definitely added a lot of value to it, which I appreciate, uh -huh. you know. Took the woman's touch. Go ahead, Daniel. All right, last yes, one. Sir. We have the, the screen up. <laughs> I saw the screen, yeah. Uh, so just to clarify, you had said that you believed Judas, Jude, the brother of James, mm -hmm. to be the author of Jude, yes? Mm -hmm. Okay, so I think what might be confusing is something that I may have misheard. Uh, if you look at Luke 6, verse 13 for me, please. Because I may have misheard you earlier. My glasses, where are they? Shoot, let's see here. Verse, Luke 6, verse 13. Thank you. Yes. I'm, I'm almost there. 12, end. When the day came, he called his disciples and chose from them twelve, whom the apostles Simon, who he named Peter, Andrew, his brother, James and John, Philip, Bartholomew, Thomas, and James, the son of Apollos, Simon, the zealot, Judas, the son of James. Judas, the son of James. Um, That's a Delphos. That should be brother, but. So that was what? I'm sorry? That's a Delphos. That should be brother. Oh, that's a mistranslation. Yeah. Okay. So, so yeah, so he was a half-brother of James. Mm -hmm. Yes. And you know, you're right. I'm an heir. Thank you for pointing it out. He, he was one of the apostles. And oh, I would just, I would, I I would fervently that. hope and pray that everyone in this room would long to see anyone under discipline under gospel preaching. I just oh, I think everyone going. does. Yeah, okay. absolutely. Thank you. And thanks again for your labors. No, yeah, my pleasure. All right. Well, with that, thanks for all your questions. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Mike Dunaway, for being you. That you have a wonderful Memorial Day. Yeah, you got you as well. You heading back? Heading back to uh, Anaheim? Or are you going to the beach? Uh,